Do you feel the improvement? Well, I must be improving because I talk to you guys more. <laughs> so, and it's, it's just gonna, it's just gonna help. <laughs> Me, me! <laughs> you look over if the guy next to you, he got these on you. I'll look at somebody else. Uh, <laughs> would you? This is a new way to high five your, your former teammate. I ain't no message to make on. Kyle, we want to thank you for joining us. Yep. Thanks for having me. I appreciate all you guys for letting me join in on your on your Zoom call. Uh, we definitely appreciate. How's everything going? Everything is good, man. Just at home, chilling with the family, not doing much, but taking care of the kids, and you know, getting this unusual family time in right now. I understand that. I got a couple questions for you. Then we're gonna open up for members of the media, possibly ask some questions. Uh, okay. and my first question, pretty much, can you just talk about your experience playing in the MEAC and at Norfolk State? Well, you got to think that it was the only place I've ever played, so it was the best experience I ever had. You know, Norfolk State, you know, did everything that they promised from day one. I handled my part. They handled theirs. Outside of that, being a part of the MEAC culture and the MEAC family was um, second to none. You know, you just saw the energy everywhere you went, the school colors, the, uh, the conference colors well represented in every gym, whether it's large numbers or small numbers. And uh, me and a lot of the guys I on the team truly, truly enjoyed our experience. And um, ultimately, my family had a great time supporting as well. You know, Kyle, what was your single most memorable moment competing in this conference? Um, probably the MEAC championship. You know, I made it as my freshman year, um, lost. And then senior year, we made it back and won. So... As a MEAC player, that's big, just winning the conference championship because, you know, those are teams that would never be forgotten. As a Norfolk State player, you know, winning a game in the tournament for the whole university and the whole conference, you know, represented well. That was probably my ultimate. But as a MEAC player, I would say the MEAC championship down in Winston-Salem at, uh, Wake, at Wake Forest University. You know, Kyle, how, was, um, how did the experience playing in the MEAC and against some of the opponents in the MEAC kind of help prepare you for your NBA career? I mean, it taught you, taught you a lot. It taught you, made you responsible, i tell you that much, you know. Uh, I know big conferences like to, you know, shut their shoulders and do their things on private planes and things like that. But, you know, when you're on them bus rides, you get to look in, look in the mirror a little bit and understand who you are, you know, and that prepared me for everything. You know, I think I was ready for any level of my pro professional career next up because of the things we had to um, deal with in the MEAC, you know, bus rides, playing small schools, um, up and down, up and down the highway. Family got a chance to come. I mean, it gave us a good experience. It gave us a chance to grow as young athletes. And I think that um, that's something that only the MEAC could have offered, especially during the time I was in at my career, during my career. Uh, you've been in the league since 2012. How amazing has, has that been for you? It's been amazing. You know, obviously my family is just, you know, huge. You know, they're pumped up every game. You know, we play a bunch of games a week, but they're pumped up every game as if, as if it's my first. Um, just being in my career, being thick, being in the thick of things, being a pro and just being um, a young adult, I guess, you know, it's, it's been fun. And, you know, it's always good to hear, you know, good things going on back at my school and go see people at my school and, you know, look at the coaches. And we still busted up about stuff eight, nine years ago. So I think it's I think that's the best part right there. And, you know, your current team, the Seven Sixers, just made the coaching change. And you have the opportunity to play for what I consider one of the best coaches in the NBA in Doc Rivers. Can you talk about what you're looking forward to and with that experience? Um, you know, he has a he has a he has like a, a culture thing about him that he kind of brings guys together, personalities and brings guys on one accord. And I think that would be great for the group that we have. Um, it would be awesome to play for a legendary coach, a championship coach like himself. Um, I'm pumped and I know a lot of the guys on the team. A lot of guys on the team are pumped as well. And I think it was the right move for the organization. And like every year, you just hope for the best, you know? And one final question for me, Kyle. You know, once it's all said and done, uh, what are your plans after your playing career comes to end? You know, I always wanted to use my, my degree, you know, and just work in, work in a field that I'm comfortable with. Obviously, sports is what I'm comfortable with. You know, obviously, I, I did a coaching clinic um, do, through the MBPA. That was pretty fun. And, you know, but did a little broadcasting here or there. That was pretty fun. But I think working in athletics, you know, 
at any level would be something I will enjoy doing, just helping the next generation, a wave of kids that kind of may not be directed by their parents the best way, like mine's were. My, my parents had no, no knowledge of what to tell me, what to do. They just leaned on the athletic department, really, and the university to kind of like guide me in the right direction. So to be one of those voices in that administrative role or, you know, in the athletics department, that would be big for me. And I think that I would really, really enjoy doing it, just like I enjoy playing basketball as my career now. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Kyle. That concludes my questions. Um, we have a couple of media members that want to ask some questions. And the first one we have is uh, Stephen Gaither from HBCU Game Day. Okay. Kyle, how you doing this morning? Hey, how you doing? Good. Doing good. Doing well. Uh, a couple of questions really quick. Uh, you're uh, 2012. You're the last uh, HBCU guy, not just me, but HBCU guy drafted into the NBA. Um, and we've seen other guys, you know, get shots but not get there. What do you think, um, do, do you feel like, uh, you know, having that, that you know, you have, you're, you're kind of a representative, not only for Norfolk State and the MEAC, but just for HBCU players overall, since you, you're one of the rare guys in, this, in this, uh, this last 20 years to get that opportunity to be drafted and then to stick around as long? Well, you, 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 you feel a sense of uh, 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 um, responsibility to represent the way that uh, HBCUs represent me. You know, good times, bad times, you know, it's always love. I think that the biggest thing you said was opportunity. You know, guys in HBCUs, especially in the MEAC, they're good enough to play at any level. It's just the opportunity that has to present itself. And, you know, us as MEAC players and MEAC coaches and, you know, a MEAC department have to take advantage of the opportunity when it comes. I think that it's a group effort considering it's a small conference. But when you talk talent, I mean, I'm just lucky enough to be on this stage showing my talent. But there's some guys in the MEAC that I still give credit to today that probably were a little better than me when I was actually in the MEAC. And I'm not not going to name no names because they'll go crazy. But we got some talent, and I think that I just got the opportunity, and God has blessed us. And then lastly, um, really quick, uh, there's been a lot of talk about top recruits and, and, and getting those guys in and everything like that. But you were a guy that's more typical. You weren't a top recruit. I think Norfolk State was your only uh, D1 offer. Um, do you think that in this – you know, everybody gets the hype about the five-star talent. Do you think uh, there's still something to be said about, uh, you know, folks who uh, are giving the underdogs the chance to prove themselves and to really uh, show that they belong as well? Do you think that uh, that's something that we should kind of focus on a little bit more in addition to five stars and all of that? I mean, definitely the underdog story is the story that America loves. Everybody loves the underdog story. And when you give somebody an opportunity and they take advantage of it, I mean, the story and the feeling at the end is, so much better than your typical five-star story that is kind of supposed to happen the right way. But I think that the MEAC and the HBCUs have to be ready for any type of talent because I think the way the world is now, I think that guys will come and be attracted by those historic HBCU names and want to change the narrative a little bit. With social media, I mean, a, a kid could go to Norfolk State, Morgan State, Delaware State, and really make a name for itself and, 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 and really shock the world just by his talents and how he conducts himself. You know, the only challenge I always say. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Yeah. I'll go get it. <laughs> Maurice, no. open his mic for a second. You're good. Keep talking. Oh, I was going to say, the only thing I always challenge HBCUs, uh, myself, and all universities, no matter what school these five-star players pick, you know, we have to be ready as a coach. We have to give them the access to the things that they're used to. We have to compete with the mid-major schools and we have to compete with the high-level schools as far as what these kids and families expect, you know, but I think that the underdog story will always be the best story, but with the way the world is and five-star recruits being attracted by the names um, and want to create their own story, I think it's a nice thing to see and I think it's a nice wave and we could probably look forward to that in the near future. Appreciate it, Kyle. All right, our next question comes from Luke Williams. Hey, Kyle, congratulations on your, your career, both for Norfolk State and in the NBA. I want to know the guys that you played with at Norfolk State that pulled off that big upset over Missouri, Penny, and those guys. Do you stay in touch with them? And how many of them are still balling like you? Oh, man, we stay in touch very, very tight. We do like a, we do like a week. We try to get together like a week down at school and just get together, you know, bust it up over some food, work out, and um, just – try to get in tune with the new guys at the school because, you know, I'm getting a little older and the young guys at the school, they may, they may not know me as well as I want to know them. So, you know, with Coach Jones still being there, I, I like to still be connected with the program. But Penny's overseas. He's playing in Italy. Um, Jamel Fuentes is still playing. And uh, we got a couple new guys that 
recently graduated still playing. So we're, still, we're all still active and we all still stay on a group chat and we stay connected, especially that championship team. I mean, we're kind of unbreakable at this point. And it's kind of a pick, uh, follow up from what Stephen asked you. Um, is, have you gotten involved at all in trying to recruit some of these guys to Norfolk State? You know, I don't think that that would be the right thing to do, considering the role I'm in. You know, if I'm asked, if I'm in the same room and I have to speak on the behalf of my university, you best believe they're going to know that that's the best university ever. But as far as being put in a position to recruit, I don't think that's my role yet. And I don't think that, you know, that's appropriate. So, you know, I kind of just fall in where I can. But if the opportunity comes and when it comes, you know, I'll let them know not only HBCUs, but Norfolk State is a nice place for you to hone your career. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle. But our next question comes from Mr. David Hall. David, I think it's, we can't hear you. Okay, we're we're going to go back to David. David, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to David. We're going to go to Keith Jones. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you doing? Hey, how you doing, Keith? Good. Hey, Ken, we really appreciate you coming on and, and joining in this, uh, this little chat. Uh, to go with, with bit what Stephen was talking about, uh, the recruiting is big. Now, Howard just picked up a, a, a big uh, recruit maker coming in. That, that's going to be big for the conference. But you being uh, an example for the conference, how do you, in the mindset of the kids coming to uh, an HBCU or in, in the MEAC specifically, how do you convince them that they should go to a school like that versus some other of the bigger schools that may be recruiting them? Um, I think that I think that we need to take the take the approach of we're in the ballpark of the other schools that they may be interested in. Give what they have to offer. Let them know what they have to, what they will receive when they get to the university, and actually, you know, deliver when they get there. You know, um, I don't think that it's a a thing of like you know. How do we pull them? How do we pull them? Just give them what we offer. And I think that some families, you know, you never know where these kids' parents went to school. These kids' parents probably went to an HBCU or, you know, they have some type of bloodline or connection to an HBCU. And I'm not even talking about African-American kids. You got white kids that just probably are not even just comfortable going on an HBCU campus because it just hasn't been made comfortable. So I think that just letting them know early what they have to offer. And the biggest thing is sticking to what you offer them you know, as far as the scenery, the, the, the location, how easy it is to get back and forth, everything that the university has to offer as far as academics, life after basketball, baseball, football, tennis, whatever it is, just like these other schools do. And I think you leave it up to the kid and the family to make the decision. And I think that the more success stories that come out of HBCUs, I think you'll have more kids gravitating to it because at the end of the day, every story will be highlighted considering there hasn't been a lot of success stories out of HBCU. So like I always say, you always want to be one of few than one of many. And I think that the way the world is, and I mean, social media with these kids are running the world. I think that, you know, everybody wants to be their own little mini story. And I think that that's enough within itself to pull a kid to a university that may not, you know, um, be the first one of the first school of waves, you know, to offer that big scholarship or something like that. So I just think that it's continuing to offer what we have to offer and sticking to it would be a big thing. Well, to your point, the landscape has changed dramatically even in the last the years since you got out of school. And it's now with the social media and the exposure or the smaller conferences, it's better go to, to a school where you'll get the reps, where you'll play, maybe be a starter, than go to be second or third on the bench coming off at a bigger school. Um, do you right. believe in that? Yeah, I mean, think about, um, I hate to keep talking about myself, but look at my situation. If I was, if I went to a school just a little bigger, just call it Old Dominion, I would have sat behind two, you know, already established big men in that CAA conference, and I would have been two years delayed for my development. So with that being said, Norfolk State offered an opportunity for me to develop to become the player I am today. I think that there's so many other stories like that, but sometimes you may get caught up in the name school, color school, apparel, and then you just go to a school because your high school thinks that that's the best thing for you. You know, I think if we attack the families and 
really let them know what um, HBCU or that particular HBCU has to offer. I think that, you know, with that potential backstory on the back end, I think that it will, it will attract families more. But like I continue to say, we have, we have to uphold it through the kids four years and actually offer something at the end of the four years or give them a, put them on the right path after four years when, you know, that, that, that fourth or fifth year eligibility is up. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from Jerry from the Undefeated. Hey, Kyle, I'm just curious, what was your initial reaction when McCormaker made the decision to go to Howard? My initial reaction as a fan was like, wow. You know, you got a kid five-star going to Howard. That's pretty, 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 excuse my language, pretty ballsy. You know, I think that, you know, says a lot about him as a player, says that he can get it done. Um, I didn't care what school he really picked, to be honest. I was just happy it was at HBCU. And I think that as a fan, a basketball fan, I'm sitting here just like you guys. I want it to pan out. I want him to be the greatest. I want him to be better than any other MEAC player to come through. Because, you know, I think he can set the trend of kids taking that jump out of high school, you know, and making that decision versus going somewhere and then coming back, transferring back home, or, you know, maybe a HBCU is giving a kid a second chance. I think that he could turn the narrative if it's a success story. Will when it becomes a success story, considering how it will do their part. Um, I'm a fan just like you are, you know, I'm sitting back waiting. We're in a tough time right now. So it's a lot of things to look forward to as far as for excitement. And I think that's one of the things that I'm excited about to see how well he does. And just following up, you know, you mentioned changing the narrative. Uh, you know, Howard hasn't had a lot of basketball success in a long time. What, uh, what kind of pressures do you think it brings to a guy like McCormaker to go out there and, and dominate and get Howard to the NCAA tournament in his first year? I mean, it creates pressure very much so, but also creates eyes and attention on him that, you know, a lot of HBCU players, I know me, one of them, and some of the guys on my team and other guys in the conference when I played, that's all we really wanted. You know, we were promised one or two ESPN games a year, and that was nice. But when you're going up against kids that play 10, 11, 12, and almost have a – and have an automatic bid into the tournament, you know, they all this exposure that these guys are getting. They don't have to play a perfect game when they're on ESPNU that one time, you know, at 12 o'clock versus Morgan State University. So I think that he has the pressure. I hope he handles that well. But with this pressure, I think that it, it, it will create a lot of exposure for him to show not only his talents, to show Howard University in a positive light, and also let people start seeing the success story from the beginning. So I think that it's a, one of those positive pressures that only he – he can handle and I think he would do well well with it. All right. We now have a question from Winston, ABC seven. Hey Kyle, what's going on, man? Behold. Behold the green and gold. You already know. Sure, absolutely. All right. So I have two questions for you. Um A I just kind of find I, I want to find out from a player's perspective. I mean, I know you you have a lot of guys that you've played with that are, you know, from D1s, Kentucky, Dukes, and this, that, and the other. What type of experiences and stories do you share about your time at, at, at Norfolk State that kind of persuades them, you know what, man, maybe I kind of missed out on something? Well, you definitely got to tell them about Fridays in the, in the cafeteria, the student union just jumping, DJ and all that. <laughs> got it. You got to throw that in their face because you just know that that's one thing you know that they have never experienced. And then you start talking – you simply start talking about the things that, you know, can make teams better. You know, when I, when I talk bus rides, you know, I don't talk about it in a negative light, but to be on the bus with guys coming from South Carolina State all the way back to Norfolk State after you handle business down in South Carolina, you know, five hours, that's kind of fun. You yeah. know what I mean? You know, on a private plane with Chick-fil-A catered. You know, so I think that, you know, they want to hear those stories because at the end of the day, it creates a personal, personable side of you, you know, and it takes you away from the, the player and the luxury to the player and who you really are. So I think that, and, and what else, you know, just the, just the, the band, you know, they see YouTube, they got YouTube, they see it, but to be a part of it is a different thing. And I think that, you know, they, they, they appreciate that from a firsthand story. And, you know, I'm putting 20 on a 10, you know, I'm adding a little something to it. You know, I'm adding some juice to it, letting them know what they really missed out on. You know what I mean? So I think that all in all, they just like hearing what they know. And I think they like to finally like visualize it through somebody that they, they know personally. So I think that those are the two biggest things, the band and the, and just the student union on a Friday going into the weekend. I think that they can't, 
they can't relate. They don't know how to. And I think that, you know, they missed out on that and they always will. Yeah, they always will. And secondly, my next question is, it's kind of the million dollar question. What do you think is the future for the, for the MEAC uh, as a whole, as far as recruiting is concerned, gameplay? What, what do you think the future is, is, is for the conference? I think the future is bright, obviously. I wouldn't say nothing less than that, but I just think that when you start thinking about the other conferences, and I'm not trying to compare, but when you start thinking about other conferences, other schools and what they do, I mean, they don't really do anything special, but they, they promise and they deliver. And I think that kids can bank on that. They can bank on a solid college career when they go to a James Madison or an Old Dominion, you know. They don't have NBA aspirations or you know, huge aspirations outside of basketball. They just want to have a good, solid college career that ultimately their, their family can be proud of and they can get an education. And I think that the MEAC has a collection of schools that can provide that. And I think the MEAC does a great job, you know, from what my experience as a player was um, with the tournament, engaging the families, keeping the schools together and things like that. So I just think that the biggest thing is, um, promising and delivering and then ultimately offering something that the other schools are offering and kind of like step out of our comfort zone and, you know, get in there and really compete with those mid-majors that are pulling these kids that should be playing at mid at the MEAC level schools. Absolutely. Kyle, thank you very much. Congratulations on your career and good luck in the future. Thank you, sir. All right. All right uh, next question comes from Mr. Mark Gray. I'm sorry. Hey, Kyle. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join us this morning. Uh, yeah. There's a fellow MEAC Hall of Famer, Rasheen Mathis, who played in the NFL at Bethune-Cookman, who once told me that Bethune-Cookman picked him. He didn't pick them. I was wondering, is there a sense with you that that was the same case with your HBCU experience at, Morgan, uh, at Norfolk State? That they picked me, I didn't pick them? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's kind of 50-50. I ultimately had to make the decision to go, but they all, they definitely offered the best, best bright future that I could have asked for at the time. Um, I think it was a great partnership and it was a great time and thing. And um, like I said, they, uh, they, 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 they told me what they had to offer and I did my part. So I think that it was just a great, great partnership, should I say. Uh, now, when you first get into the league, you're sort of an ambassador. You have to express your HBCU experience. Now, I'm looking at your peers, your all-star superstar peers. Steph Curry, $6 million to Howard to start a golf program. Chris Paul constantly representing with the support black college gear. I mean, there are guys throughout the league since you've been there who've been embracing the marketing, the messaging of the HBCU uh, experience. So I guess my question would be twofold. A, does it shock you to see this? as it's going on right now. And when you first came into the league, would you have thought that you would have seen so many players who did not go to HBCUs now representing for them? I think that, I think that to answer your first part, I think that it goes back with the whole bloodline thing. You know, you look at these guys that represent HBCUs in a positive light and to have no problem donating and um, repping different schools and things like that, because I'm sure they had an aunt, uncle, cousin, brother, sister, to go, one, go to one of these schools and they had that opportunity to experience what a HBCU campus had to offer, probably just visiting with their family member or their dad was a great, or their mom was a track athlete at whatever school in their hometown, you know. It's just so happened they went to a bigger school in the area or flew across the country and went to a powerhouse. I think that that's the biggest thing. We can't remove ourselves too far from what these kids are used to. Um, and that's from African-American and white in any other nationality, I would say. And the second part is, it doesn't surprise me because, you know, when things are hot, everybody jumps on it. And I think that HBCUs are hot at the moment. And I think that they've always been hot. The story has always been cool, but everybody wants to help to, you know, like I said, that underdog story or that story of, yeah, you guys are repping this, but I'm gonna rep that because this is a little cooler to do. So to see guys wear different universities, you know, and talking to Chris Paul and stuff like that, his connection and why he does it, it's shocking, but at the same time, it's really not because, I mean, who wants to walk around with it? Be honest, who wants to walk around with a North Carolina State University hoodie on if you have no connection to it? Because if you don't, you don't, you know what I mean? But if you have a connection to North Carolina Central, you'll wear those colors, even if you didn't even go there. So it's just a different vibe, just a different feeling. And at the end of the day, I think everybody's comfortable repping HBCUs.
only because you uh, you use the word fad. Do you think it's something that has a long term shelf life, or do you think it's something that's uh, kind of like a, a a passing fad to use your term? I think it. I think it. I think it is definitely hot right now, and like anything, we got to strike while the iron is hot. But I think it can go from a fad to something permanent if we handle this correctly. When I say if we can handle it correctly, I mean you know deliver like I say. HBCUs can and will, and I think that the fad will turn into something that people could really look forward to and be a little more consistent and permanent. Thank you, man. Congratulations. You've been a great ambassador for our cause, bro. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Our next question comes from David Hall, Virginia Pilot. Hey, Kyle. Good to see you. Sorry about the earlier mess up. Um, this, this is similar to what you were just asked, but uh, you've been very generous with Norfolk State. Uh, with the program, why has that been important to you? I mean, I mean, you can answer that question. They gave me an opportunity of a lifetime, so that goes a little deeper than you know. Um, how can I how, how I can express it? I mean, the university, like I always said, did their part and they did it in a nice fashion, considering they took in my family and everything. So, um, just being a part of the culture, you know, you look at the coaches. The coaches are still the same. You look at the athletic department, it may have shifted a little bit, but for the most part, it's a lot of familiar faces. I always feel comfortable going back to the university from the parking department to the people that help keep the gym clean. So I just like to, you know, be, be, be um, a part of it. I like to be engaged and I'm a fan now. Now that I don't go there, I'm a fan of the university and I want to see the university do great things. And um, yeah, so my giving is just out of my heart and out of, it's for my family. Um, in light of COVID, what kind of uh, working out are you able to do right now? Oh, I've been staying active, you know, a lot of yoga, a lot of stuff like that. You know, we have a lot of controlled setting gyms that we've set up, you know, less than 20 guys, COVID tests a couple times, a couple times a month. So we're pretty safe, you know, like everybody, you take your own risk, but I've been able to get a little, get a little bit in and, you know, getting ready for this next season. I'll be headed out as if this was my off season, I'll be headed out to do some heavy, heavy training out in Las Vegas to really go, um, gear up for the next season. So picking things up, but like I said, everybody's doing things at their own risk. And I think that, you know, I am too. Thanks, man, I appreciate it. No problem, thank you. All right, now final question comes from Trayvon Miles. Hey Kyle, how you doing, man? How you doing, man? Pretty good. good. Uh, I just want to piggyback off of David's question a little bit. Uh, I can remember a time before I was a journalist uh, a game in particular with you at Maryland Eastern Shore um, and just your time in particular at the MEAC tournament uh, in your senior year. How much fun were you having in that final year? I can remember you dominating on the court, talking trash to the fans, just having a good time all together. How fun on the court was that final year, if you could go back and reflect? I mean, that final year was, 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 was fun from day one. You know, um, you could start from conditioning. Even though I hated off-season conditioning, um, it was great because I knew it was my last one. Um, I knew this was the last group of guys I would have the opportunity to do something great with. And I put a lot of pressure on myself and, you know, Coach Jones and the coaching staff and Coach Evans and Coach Vickers, you know, they somewhat put their own pressure on me in different ways, you know, trying to just make yeah, this year the best um, possible. So... I think that um, – What's up? Okay, am, I, am I good? No. Somebody didn't mute their mic. You're good. Oh, I think, that, I think that that year had a lot of pressure with it, but, you know, I started putting a little too much pressure on myself. And to fast forward, one of the coaches, Coach Vickers, he said, you know, you can't play your way if you don't have a smile on your face. So I turned that pressure into just that positive. Just every game is different. You know, you just get flowing, you get flowing. Whatever happens, happens. And, I really was just wanted to be not only one of the best players at Norfolk State as my time was ending, but I wanted that whole team to reap the benefits of my many success that I could probably do for myself. So it started to become just a, a group thing. You know, my roommate was a walk-on, so I needed him to enjoy that year just as much as I did, and I was able to help him in that department. But every game was a different game. Every road trip was fun. Every hotel stay was fun, and then we had a really, really good time, and we handled our business on and off the court. Thanks, man. Congratulations. Appreciate it, man. Kyle, can't thank you enough, man. You did an awesome job. I really appreciate it more than you ever know. All right, cool. I appreciate you guys, and good luck to everybody during this time.